Hi, I'm Kay Walter. At Bergen Community College, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, Bergen Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. There he is. He nice says he's job, nervous, Steve. but he's uh, Brian nice Kirk. Job. Oh uh, he's God. the lead man, front man, Brian Kirk and the Jerks. Guitar solos, he does it all. How you doing? You have to read that? Oh, come on, stop. Come on. Wouldn't it come right off the top of your head? It should have. Yeah, it should have. Well, Not that I'm, I haven't I'm... seen you perform. I know. I thought we weren't going to talk about that. What do you mean? You, you being a Jenkinson, do you mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a family event, you want event, to bring it up? It? it was a family event. You had wasn't your kids. It? You had a whole it, orphanage there. It was a beautiful Saturday at the Jersey Shore at Jenkinson's in Point Pleasant. Mm -hmm. What did you start this whole thing? <laughs> Uh, this disaster of mine that I'm on, um, I started early 90s. Why? Early 90s solo acoustic. Was it just, uh, it was just? It was just me for about three years until a drunken bass player and a drunken drummer came in and said, we could play behind you. And I was like, I don't really need a band. I don't want to. And they were like, no, 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 let's try it. They came one time and it just clicked. And from then it's been a bunch of different guys for almost 25 years. 25 Where'd you years? grow up? Red Bank, Middletown. Well, Middletown, actually. But a lot of music down there. Well, yes. Well, course. Springsteen. Well, Springsteen. Was yeah, he, the man. I mean, was, was he a big influence for you? Enormous. It was him and John Lennon. I mean, well, that was... Wow, that's, that's... No, they're not that different. If you talk about, about that. It. Well, well, because, I mean, uh, uh, just passionate music. Uh, you know, something that you connect to. Um, you know, just as, with Springsteen, like... What does Springsteen mean to you? Le, well, John Lennon, an opening line would be, uh, words are flowing out like endless stream. That's just, mm. you know, Springsteen, screen door slams, Mary's dress waves. The picture of it, that's, that's why they're not that far apart. I mean, it's just the poetry of it behind the great melodies. Forget it. Just classic. When you were a kid, mm -hmm. was music in your life? Oh, yeah. My dad was... Uh, had played with Sinatra at one point. Get, had a get band, out of here. Had a big band in the, in the Wh 40s. Where was all this? In Jersey City. Irish Catholic family from Jersey City. So Sinatra's in Hoboken. Sinatra's in Hoboken. Your dad's in Jersey City. My dad's in Jersey City. And at the time, because big bands were 30 people, they didn't go to a club like we did. We didn't pick up our amplifiers and go somewhere. So um, the, the singers went around to the bands. So the bands would play the standards, and, you know, Dinah Shore would come, and Sinatra. and uh, Yeah, pictures of this are very cool. Very cool. So did you start playing as a kid? I started playing, no. I was more of a football guy, and I broke my collarbone playing football. And it, my arm was stuck like this, and my dad got me a guitar. And I just, you know, Is that I'm really how there, it started? Because that's a I'm good not story. Kidding you, I'm not kidding you. That's how it started. My dad got me a guitar, and that's how I started playing. Now, he wasn't a guitar player, but my brother was. My older brother was. So there was music throughout the house constantly. And there was but, always debates of, you know, by the time rock came on, my older brother's and sisters, you know, talking about, you know, Springsteen or Jackson Brown and Billy Joel and the merits of that between Sinatra and Dean Martin and, you know, those kind of debates but, around but I gotta my say house. This, for those who have been fortunate enough to see you, by the way, big at the Jersey Shore. Huge. Okay, tell the In places. the two block radius of Seabright. Otherwise, <laughs> completely unknown. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, tell folks where at the Jersey Shore. Well, it was Donovan's Reef, God rest its soul, got wiped out in Sandy. That's the question I get asked most of all, especially by your cameraman over there. Yeah, because um, he wants to go back. He wants to go back to Donovan's. Exactly. Everybody wants to go back to Donovan's to drink. 
Yeah, and I'll um, hear you. But what about where I saw you at Jenkins? Is that a regular? That's a regular thing during the summer. Saturdays. Saturday afternoons during the summer. Um, but we also play Just Jakes and Montclair. We just sold out BB King's in Times Square. Did you really? Yes. Does that impress you? That's very impressive. Very impressive. I'm very impressive. Well, here's the thing I'm curious about. It's one thing to talk about the guitar with the arm. The guitar with the arm? The whole thing. But the other thing I'm impressed by is watching you on stage. You are an amazing performer. Ah, oh, thank you. You have That's nice tremendous hear. energy and you connect with people on a very personal level. Where did that whole ability to feel so confident and comfortable on stage come from? I, an insecurity, I would imagine. I'm not kidding you. It's an insecurity of that it's not enough, it was never enough for me to play music at people. You know, watch me play whatever. Watch me play Thunder Road. It's not, you know, uh, I, I love jokes. I love stand-up comedian. So I try to incorporate that. I try to just... You know, I make it like it's my living room. And everybody's there in my living room. What do you want to hear? We make fun of one another. It goes on. So what that does, and I don't do it consciously, but it just happens, is that it just connects the audience with the band, and it just becomes... Maybe it's not conscious. You're I, don't up there, I, you're... I don't think I actively think of that. It's the thought process in my head that goes, okay, I've got to, you know, all right, what does this crowd want? And then let's read this. I just think people are people, no matter where you play. And then... You just, you're up there and you're doing your thing and it just works. I'm gonna ask you about uh, something that Southside Johnny said. Uh, you guys are on this shoot. Still sounds great, that man. He, he's oh. the best. Oh. We had him at, uh, these guys, we did the NJ Pack shoot. We are shooting him at NJ Pack, and he, I said, what about the Jersey sound? And he said, no, it's not a Jersey sound. Jim, what did he say he called it Jersey? He said the Jersey, Jersey soul. He said, there's something about Jersey soul. I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, there is, trust me on this. Do you think there's something about a Jersey soul. A Jersey soul. I, I you know what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> or is it just South outside? Side, I never know what he's talking about. <laughs> but uh, you know, if if, if there's oh, if this if, sound, if what, so what, what it sounds is to it? me initially is that it's just you go back to that music. Whether it was let's go back to Southside. You listen to Southside's early records; they're still great. So soul music to me is something that hits you internally and will, and will, be, uh, uh, it will be going on for, I can't think of the word now, going on forever. It will be But eternal. is it a Jersey thing at It'll all? Be, uh, you think there's anything no, about Jersey music? Because Van Morrison had it. You know, uh, the Stones had it. The Beatles had it. I mean, but maybe in a different sense. I think, I think the Jersey soul thing, they took soul music. Stuff that now this I didn't realize it until at my introduction into Jersey music and Bruce and Southside and all those guys. Then I started listening to what they were listening to, which was Van Morrison. Van Morrison was listening to Jackie Wilson, and those that those kind of horn things that that the um, um, you know in the midnight hour and things like mm. that, where you could hear the you can hear the progression of where it got to the Jersey show, soul sound, as Southside says. This doesn't get old for you, does it? Oh my God, no, never. Why? I don't know. I don't know. It's just fun. So people say it should stuff. always be fun, though. That's why it probably doesn't get old. It shouldn't be about. I don't get over. I don't get on my guys about a bad lead in E minor. Nobody cares. Nobody what cares. Mean, nobody about, cares. Well, nobody. We're not because we're not a jazz group. We're not. We're not people. It's you know, music has different levels. And in one level, if it's a jazz club and you're listening to incredible jazz stuff, you you look for the precision of it. In if you're a saloon singer and a, and a bar guy like me. You, you, the object is above everything to create a vibe. And you create a vibe and, and have fun. And ultimately, I said to the guys, I got, I want you looking at your shoes. Just have some fun. That's all what I mean want. You're looking at the shoes. Well, you know, you have, you, you know, Nirvana was like that. You know, they would play like that. And Nirvana got, want, got over because their, their songs were so amazing. But, you know, it wasn't about giving the people a show. It's you about know, them, to me, isn't it? it's, it, it, it's, it's about giving people a show. You should always give them a show. Yeah. My guys rolled their eyes before I said, come on, guys, give them a show. You believe this stuff. Of course I do. You're not even like having to pump yourself up. You live it, you believe it every day. Rock and roll, baby. I got to ask you this one. Go ahead. Number one leadership lesson you have learned in all the years that you have been a band leader is? So I uh, own a telephone company during the day, right? And I installed a phone system for a, uh, a Jewish jeweler in Homedale, New Jersey. He said to me, he goes, you know what? I, I asked him how he became so successful at a line of jewelry stores. He said, I allow a little theft. 
and what he meant by that. I knew what he meant right away. As a leader, you don't worry about the little minutia of all this. I see guys get so involved in, oh, you know, uh, they worry about this and that. When you look at the gestalt of things, the overall vibe, like getting back to our original question. As a leader, my, uh, my leadership abilities excel when there's a vibe in the audience. And that's, that's where my goal comes as of being a leader. Sometimes it's not those little things that we it's obsess It's never over. the little things. I got to remember that. You don't that. sweat them. I got to remember that. Allow a little theft, Steve. I wish my staff wasn't listening to you right now because uh, it just created problems for Sorry. all of us. No, that's all right. It's too late. You said it. It's on the air. Brian Kirk, <laughs> uh, guitar, vocals, all that with Brian all Kirk. All that. Uh, but he's more importantly, important he's a leader and he's great and he's one of the best performers I've ever seen. We'll be right back right after this. You never date yourself. <laughs> To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Harry Banchek, Director of the Pediatric Department, Holy Name Medical Center. Good to see you, Doctor. Pleasure to be here. Uh, with four kids from four to 22, that's nuts, right? That's a whole other story. I'm fascinated, not just me, everyone out there watching who has kids or thinks about kids, worried about kids. Um, one of the biggest issues that comes up with kids, vaccines. Jenny McCarthy talks a lot about this, but she isn't the only source. Sometimes she says, look, vaccines are bad, they're dangerous, they cause problems, you say? I say, look at the data, look at the reality of the situation, and I say vaccines have been shown to save more lives than they c cause any problems. So, what is the problem in terms of how people get information about vaccines and other issues related to how we're supposed to be taking care of our kids? Well, the internet, obviously, everyone gets to say what they want without any data to prove what they're saying is correct. That's number one. Plus, the generation that we're dealing with now is the first generation in the history of society that has not had to suffer from any of these diseases. So they can't see the benefit of preventing something that they've never had. You got to, you, here's the problem that I look at. You've got a, a, a mom or a dad or both who come in, they say, doctor, I just don't want to get my kid vaccinated because I've heard so many th horror stories. I don't want to do it. You say. Listen, I give them my opinion and it's their child that they want to do. But I think they're acting foolish in the fact that as an older as an older pediatrician who's been around the block a long time, mm -hmm. I've seen children die. You know, not everyone dies from these things. I have children. You know, we don't see those diseases anymore mm -hmm. because they're vaccinated, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, a resident. As a younger doctor, the number one cause of death in children was haemophilus influenza B, pneumococcal bacteremia, sepsis, epiglottitis. We don't see it anymore. So therefore, people are not afraid of it because they're vaccinated. Why'd you go into this uh, field of medicine? You have so many options. Truthfully? Yeah. It's the only one I liked. <laughs> you know. What do you like about it? I like dealing with the living. I like dealing with kids going on their way up people going on their way up, as opposed to other doctors deal with people going on their way down. But you know what's so fascinating to me about the whole thing with pediatricians? I told you that our kids have the same pediatrician, even our 22-year-old, um, same pediatrician after all these years, he's been great, with the same one that the other kids have. And I, I'm thinking to myself, come on, son, you're, you're 22. And you said to me right before we got on the air, what's the matter with you? He's known him his whole life. When's enough enough? Enough is enough when, it's, when you need some different help. I mean, in our system, the way we have it set up right now is if you go from a pediatrician, you usually wind up going to an internist. Your 22-year-old son doesn't need to have a cardiogram right. and his cholesterol checked nine times. He needs someone who's more of an infectious disease and psychologist for them at that age. And that's where the pediatrician fits in. So look at, look at, I'm curious about this. As a pediatrician, do you look at 
certain, are you looking for certain things, looking at certain things at certain periods of time? Because uh, say from birth to five, five to 10, do you have those periods where you say, hey, certain points in time, we're looking for certain things, we're aware of certain things? Um, in the earlier children, where the younger age, well, obviously in infants, you're looking for their developmental milestones, both motor and social. And then, you know, in our world at five, you're worried about their academic performance in school and their social interactions. And then as they get to become adolescents, you're worried about their social interactions and their extracurricular activities out of school, you know, drug use, smoking. And now, uh, you know, obesity, there are many things, you know, pediatricians actually serve multi purposes. We're not medical doctors only, we become psychologists. Is that true? Yeah. On that issue, do you think, and I've often thought about this, do you think that pediatricians are expected to be and do too much? You know, when people are, call me too much, yes, but no, I think we are. No, no, seriously, you know, that you're expected, you just said that, but you're not trained as a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Well, well I'm not, I don't practice psychiatry and I don't practice psychology, but part of what I do is I deal with children with emotional issues, parents who have emotional issues because of and with their children. So I do have some psychology. I'm not trained in it, but I've done it for 32 years. You can't ignore it. It's a very large because part of the Because doesn't that impact the clinical issues, the medical issues that deal with one's body? Absolutely. And so much of what we see now is anxiety. Talk about that. Um, I've seen in my 32 years a tremendous rise of anxiety in children. Anxiety in children? Yes. Over what? Over things that they have seen that they don't quite understand, pressure put on them, the increase in the use of social media which tells you about a beheading in another country. These things have led, in my opinion, anxiety to be a very important situation that I deal with all the time. You know, I, it's... I, I hesitate to do this and my producers don't hesitate to say shut up and don't talk about it. Our young daughter this morning literally said, Daddy, she saw something about a bad guy on, on the news. I didn't realize she saw it. And she said to me, Daddy, that bad guy, and I knew who she was talking about, and I knew what she was talking about. She said, Daddy, that bad guy wasn't a real bad guy. That bad guy was just in a cartoon, right? Or on a TV show. And it wasn't. It was a real bad guy. And it was a real bad situation. And I'm sitting there going, she's four years old. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah. I think that there is. You can't just blow that uh, off and go, oh, come on, Olivia. Right. Stay. And then when that child, in a very short time, may all of a sudden, at one time, at one moment, all of a sudden had be fearful of something. You don't really know what it was. Something shook that child. But if, you make, if we talk about it too much, aren't you drawing too much attention to it? Well, we're not drawing the attention to it. We're she just did. trying to find out why this child is anxious all of a sudden. But we can't just ignore those things. Absolutely not. You don't have to rush them to psychiatrists and medicate them. Right. And, but you have to address it and try and teach them how to deal with their fears. Because there's so much more to worry about now. Is it fair to say that sometimes you get kids to talk about things that parents sometimes have a hard time getting their kids to talk about? Uh, they will sometimes open up to me. I can't, I, I'm not really sure. I think they just, they don't even know what they're afraid of sometimes either. Well, just being in this world and, and being exposed to things, and the internet does, social media does have an impact. It has a tremendous impact on the way parents deal with their children, worrying about vaccines, worrying about things, and children seeing things that they shouldn't be seeing. Yeah, the beheading thing is something. They've always been around. The ISIS beheading thing, boy, you see it come on and you're not, you don't move fast enough and the kid asks, what's that about? What's that all what, about? Give me that conversation. It's all another subject. Dr. Harry Banchek, who is Director of Pediatric Department at Holy Name Medical Center, I want to thank you for joining us and, and more importantly for all the kids that you've been helping for a long time and will continue to do. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Stay right there. One on one will continue right after this. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, Visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are thrilled once again to be joined by our great friend, Jerry Walker, CEO and president of Team Walker. How you doing, Jerry? Doing well, man. How you doing? 
Good. Yeah. Uh, by the way, for people who don't know, before you did this whole thing, uh, your background in sports, Seton Hall? Yes, St. Anthony's first, then Seton Hall, a little bit the Nets, then I went overseas, five different countries, France, Spain, Sweden, traveled the world, so I had a great experience. And now your life really started. Yeah, yeah. Tell I'm, me I'm about the, Team Walker. What is it? It's God's work. Uh, it's something that uh, has been in my family over 60 years. It's something that... Tell me about your grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather, James Pop Curry, he got inducted to the Jersey City Hall of Fame, and he managed to do social service work himself and having 16 kids, so he's a little bit better than me. You mm. know, he... Uh, Managed to help the whole community, and I, I'm just carrying a tradition. Tell them, as we look at a picture of your grandfather right now, uh, your organization does what right now? Well, we our number one focus now is uh, the STEM, actually. We, we know the future in terms of job Science, creation. technology, engineering, yes. and math? Yes, yes. We actually um, just got invited to this NASA challenge, STEM challenge. Uh, it was only seven uh, agencies selected in the state to represent our state, so we one of them. We're pretty proud of that, so we're pretty That's excited great. about that. Uh, so it's working. Uh, you know, the kids are getting educated. We got a lot of great stories. Uh, one kid in, in particular, Shaquan Jackson, he just graduated for uh, St. Joe's. He's now back running our athletic department uh, at Team Walker. So we have guys that's coming back, lending a hand, helping out, and getting involved with the processes too. And you're always raising money, you always have new initiatives. You have a new learning center? Yes, yes. Talk we about just, that. Yeah, man. We um, it's, It took me 12 years to get to this point, Steve. I was on here before. And That's right. We talked about it. Now it came to fruition, and we just you know, cut the ribbon in May. taking a look at the picture right now. Yeah, there you go, right there. Well, man. What's going to go on inside there, Jerry? All sorts of things. There's a resource center for everybody. Um, you know, we do senior services. We do just different things, life skills, and some job training, some GED. We're just trying to do a little bit of everything to help the community out entirely. Why well, was that the, one of the best days of your life, you said? That. Absolutely, one of the best days of my life. It was it was so emotional for me to finally see something that I've been talking about for so long, and a lot of the Seton Hall folks know it. I just been kept my eyes on the prize and, and kept consistent. You know, just kept at it every day. You know, we've known each other a long time, all the way, way, way back. Talking about Seton Hall, some of us were just, you know, with PJ. Yes, uh, Carlissimo. Yes, yes. and uh, a great coach and a great team that you had. Great teamwork. Yes, you've always been a team player. But sports is one thing. Yep. This stuff, the stakes are even higher. Yep. Why do you care so much about these kids, particularly in Jersey City? Well, it, it's, um, like I said, it's something that I've been around all my life. Um, it's something that I know, you know, the kids can actually learn. I believe what do you in see the in these kids? Well, I see in these kids a, a bright future. You know, I see our future, and I see that if we don't develop our kids, I also see the other side of things, too. So I'm, Describe that other side. Well, the other you know side well. is, you know, it's, it, in the neighborhood, we all say, you know, you either go the right way, you're going to be dead or jail, in jail. So we, we don't want them sort of things. You know, although it's a big initiative for second chance programs in Jersey City, but, you know, we believe in the first chance. So we, we want to give the kids the tools and everything that they need, all of them to succeed, and don't even have to go to the, the system and, and be processed hey, in that system. what do they need? They need education. You know, Talk education Education is key. You know, education is key. Education is the number one thing to get anybody out of any certain circumstances of poverty. If people get educated and understand, you, you make better decisions, you, you know, your, your, your mind open up, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. And once you get that light bulb come on and you know you can do it, that's a wonderful feeling. And, you're, and your folks are helping with them after school. So they go to school. Yep. You can't control what happens during the day. Correct. But then after school, what happens? Well, they come into a safe environment, a structured environment, and we make it fun for the kids. We, we have a lot of cool stuff because we understand the whole day they, they're in school and there's a rigorous process for them. So we make it a fun challenge for them. So we do a lot of different things with the kids, like a lot of math games where they could get involved, you know, and, and be a team concept. We, we do a lot of group learning. Uh, our facility is a state-of-the-art facility. We have some great furniture that's uh, from Steelcase, and we, we know there's a lot of group learning with this furniture. So we have smart boards. We have all sorts of things that keep the kids, you know, in, in the future, basically. And we know that doing our research in terms of the jobs in the future mm. is going to be in them fields. Yeah, but you're in Jersey City, and I think to myself, wait a minute. You got a farmer's market. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, oh man, that is something wonderful. We hooked up with, uh, you know, chipping on the grow the row. You're always hooking up with people. Yeah, I, yeah that's what it is. It's about relationships, <laughs> man. It's about relationships, and I and I, I seem to do a good job. You seem with to that. be good on relationships. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm just a good guy. I'm a humble guy. I'm uh, somebody that's approachable and somebody that people really trust. So what's I, going I, on in this farmer's market? We're looking. Yeah, at so we video. do this every Saturday during the summer months. Like I said, it's America's grow the row. They out out of Pitt Town, New Jersey. They're good people. Um, yeah, they're real good people. Real good people. Um, and we do. 
like a free farmer's market every Saturday from like the month of June all the way up into November. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And, and a lot of times in a, in a city, it's not a lot of fresh choices. You know, you it's go to the food corner, desert. Yeah, it's the corner bodegas get, and stuff like that. So we promote healthy living and we do a lot of different things. Fruits and vegetables in Jersey yes, City. Yes, and it's delicious they, too. They I, need it. Oh, absolutely. And I got to tell you, Jersey got the best corn, Steve. It's so delicious. <laughs> you know, we, we go out to the farm with the kids and we actually go out there and pick and we just eat the corn right off the, off the bristle there. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, you put on this earth not just to be a great power forward, yes. um, but also to do this work? Yes, yes, I, and, I, and I believe that. And a lot of people always ask me, you know, Jerry, why do you do this? Because I had a lot of opportunity to, to college, you know, to, to be a coach or, you know, athletic director, et cetera. But I chose this, and I tell them, you know, I'm a Christian, man. My mom is a pastor, um, and I, I do this, you know, I'm trying to make it to heaven, I tell people, I, you know, and I'm doing God's work right now. So that's why I do it, and I feel good. And it teaches me a lot, too. I mean, the kids give me a lot in return. So it's, it's, it's not that I'm just giving it all to the kids. I'm getting a lot back, too. You're a very young man. You ran for office one time before? Yes. Jersey City? Yes. Do you have a desire to run for office again? Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, Steve. And one of the reasons why, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people, and, you know, when it comes to Hudson County politics, you always, you know, you always have to say, oh, man, these guys, you know, crooks or whatever. So I was a little wary of that uh, because people know me as a, a good guy. But if you don't be involved, um, you know, you, you let the bad guys be involved, basically. So I'm, I'm pretty interested in that because that's, you know, some of the decision making uh, that goes on affects, you know, our communities. So, you can't stand on the sideline? Um, I'm not really a sideline, but I'm a, I'm a starter. <laughs> so, I hear you. I gotta yeah. ask you before, before I let yeah. you out of here. Uh, we do a series called Lessons in Leadership. Number one leadership lesson you have learned in all of your career is? It's the three D's, which is dedication, determination, and discipline. We believe if we apply them three things to your life, you know, you'll be have some success in, in this world, so. Gotta work hard every day. You gotta work hard. Every day, every day, and, and you know, work ethic is everything, and being consistent is key too. I tell that to the kids all the time. If I would have stopped doing this, uh, the, the building would never been there. So now it's there. Uh, it's a testament to, to my hard work, and we're gonna keep striving to make Jersey City the best, better, best city in the country. You're an all star. You know that, Jerry? Yeah, thank you, Steve. I appreciate and that. You have an open invitation here on public broadcasting. Absolutely, Steve, and I appreciate your family too, man. Keep all it right. up every all day. Right. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. We're proud of you, Jerry. All right. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, Bergen Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges. New Jersey Natural Gas, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm a catastrophic case manager. I'm a nurse. I feel a sense of responsibility to each and every member that I speak with on the phone. I know where they live, I know their towns, I know the hospitals they go to. A lot of times I know their physicians and um, I love helping people at very difficult times of their lives. The job I have now is the perfect job for me. I think I was born a nurse. <laughs>